uh, it's my pleasure tonight, actually, to um, uh, introduce and um, uh, look after uh, Brian Gaston, um, who is a, a speaker for tonight. Brian's from um, from Queensland, and for most of you who might remember, he was going to talk to us last November, um, but then he decided he wanted to go into hospital and have his chest opened and uh, a few things done with his aorta. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate that he's uh, he's taken the time to come down again and uh, takes uh, this time to be with us tonight uh, to talk on this topic. Uh, so thank you, Brian. Um, I've known Brian for about three years, I think, because uh, we, we jointly have a bit of a passion in um, what the um, view of public transport could be in, um, in Melbourne, and in, in fact, generally. Um, now, Brian, just a, a short bio on Brian. Brian's, Brian's actually a retired civil engineer. Um, he's had a career spanning more than half a century um, uh, working in design and construction of many and varied projects in Australia and overseas. Um, snowy mountain schemes in the 60s, uh, grain handling installations on the Darling Downs in more recent years, and uh, many of these projects would raise as infrastructure that were built actually to um, enhance and support and benefit the, uh, the nation. Um, in retirement, and I think you've been retired for a few years now, uh, from what I understand. 13, uh, 13 years, there we go. Um, uh, Brian's maintained an interest in the infrastructure and he actively advocates uh, better efficiency in moving people around the cities using uh, modern technology uh, to conserve resources and reduce pollution. And what Brian will be talking about tonight is not a, um, an actual uh, factual thing. Um, what Brian wants to talk about is a concept. Um, and I think Brian is uh, what you might call a thought stimulator and hopefully um, we're going to get a lot of thought um, stimulation in the audience tonight on what public transport could look like. So Brian, welcome and uh, take it. Thanks <laughs> and good evening to all. A warm welcome to everybody here in the theatre. We're at uh, Swinburne in Melbourne. For those who may be watching uh, from some other place, uh, I include those in the welcome. I know as well all the people who have taken who will be tuned in, and I'm talking to an audience that range in ages from nine through to the late 70s. Uh, many technical and a lot who are not. So I have to be conscious of pitching the material to suit a wide audience. Thanks for your interest. Thanks for coming along, making the time. I'm hoping we can have a bit of fun tonight to stimulate you, introduce some ideas that are novel, and perhaps to challenge some of you to think about things in a quite different way. I plan to give a short talk. The official talk runs 10 minutes, then show 31 slides. Then I might have a word or two to say just to round things up, and then we'll open up for Bedlam. Uh, discussion, questions, throw tomatoes, whatever it is that you want to do. In my talk I'll be introducing you to something I've called the SPEC system, the SP Express Commuter System, uh, about which I wrote a book called Goodbye Gridlock back in 2006. But I've been on this hobby horse since at least back into 1970. It takes a long time, I think, to launch fresh ideas and get something happening. <coughs> now the prepared section of the talk, I have some notes. Um, if somebody as eminent as Pope Francis can read from notes, then I guess you'll for forgive me if I refer to them from time to time, just to make sure that I stay on track. I have a vision. When I close my eyes, I can see with startling clarity a future city in which people whiz about 
free of traffic jams. The public transport system is unlike anything I can see with my eyes open anywhere in the world. I've been invited along tonight to share this vision with you and I thank Michael and the committee for inviting me. I've certainly looked forward to the opportunity of sharing these ideas about public transport in future megacities with all of you. I see it as finding the holy grail of free flowing traffic. Central to my topic, central to my topic is a radical concept for moving people about, one that I call the spec system. So tonight I'm here to explain it and to look at its claimed benefits. But first, to set the mood and the scene, I want us to think about a few fundamental issues and to consider some background. There are some questions we may ask. Do we have congestion problems? Are we globally solving these with our present approaches? Is the car the answer, however we fuel it? Are traffic jams an inevitable part of city living? Just have to endure them. What stops people making more use of public transport? Should we work on radical new schemes in this country or wait and import the best schemes from abroad when somebody else has developed? There's some of the questions to set the scene. There are three key points to my presentation tonight. The first one is, there is a problem. The second one is introducing you to the spec system as a suggested idea to think about in searching for a solution. And the third one is my claim, my contention, that here in this country we have enough expertise, we have the brains, we have the people, we have the range of skills that we can actually lead the world. We shouldn't feel that we're in any way not in a position to do that. We've done it in the past with all sorts of Australian inventions. At this point, let us just spend a little while considering mega cities. The challenge of improving life in any big city deserves a rethink about the way in which we move people about. Congestion, pollution and associated ills are bad enough now, but two factors are going to work together to make things far worse if all we do is stick to what we do now. The first dynamic is the increasing global population. I find it very sobering to think that it took all of human history until the year 1804 for us to get to the first billion. Yet by the early 1970s, we were adding another billion about every 12 years to reach our present seven. Soon it is forecast that we'll be adding another billion every eight years. And additionally, these people are moving from rural areas to the city. So that's the second dynamic, the drift from rural to urban living. Whilst he's not solely the cause, Henry Ford, and I quote here from literature, accelerated the pace at which people left the countryside and moved to cities, unquote. His vision back then, uh, uh, that is of mass producing cars, stimulated the creation of a middle class, 
people well off enough to be able to buy these cars by earning good wages in his factories. So you see the dynamic. We've got people who were fairly poor rural workers. Henry Ford comes along, wants to invent a production line, T-model Fords. He takes those people, they're workers, they earn the wages so they become his customers. So they buy the product. He's got a ready-made market, very clever man. When he left the family farm at the age of 16, less than 20% of Americans lived in cities. His subsequent efforts and vision helped change that, and globally the statistic is now about 50%. In 35 years from now, it will be two in every three. Now, if you're interested in these population uh, estimates, the UN every two years put out information about how they see the world. And I can tell you it's pretty scary. I might talk a little more about that later, mega cities and the growth, but it's scary stuff. My point is that bigger, more crowded cities will need better arteries. They're no different to us with a human body. We've got all these veins, we've got the arteries. We know the picture, we know what it's like. The cities need their arteries to flow freely for the good of their health. So repeating my point number one, we have a problem. Now let's have a word or two about what we're currently doing. Our present public transport systems are largely based on 19th, not even 20th century technology. And this is the result of tinkering at the margins. Officials would rather do this than do something radical. I know from personally. Differently. Very difficult. In Queensland, it has been described as visionary to invest in more buses or to consider installing light rail as they're doing at the Gold Coast. Tied some bureaucrats and politics. But isn't a tram still a tram? As when they were steam driven or cable hauled. Tonight I plead for a different approach, one in which we start with an open mind, having no fixed position, help set us up with uncluttered minds. This is where I think we should start. I'll remind you what it looks like a blank sheet. We don't use paper very much anymore. We do all our work on screens with clever gadgets. I want to start with a blank sheet. Also, I want us to go from the broad to the particular. I want to think in a broad overview. But I accept the devil's in the detail, and we'll sh we shall get to that later in the evening. But the process I'm suggesting starts with a broad overview. It's interesting to begin by considering in broad terms what a commuter wants when they travel around the city. And I think we know without a lot of expensive research, we can do a fairly good job of specifying that. We'll see that up in the PowerPoint slides a little later on. At this point, we might consider, I'm trying to start a crusade, a crusade for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail being free flowing arteries in cities. When we are clear on the broad features of the Holy Grail, then I think we'll be able to apply our energies, our ingenuity, our cleverness to fixes. to actually designing and building the system. And there is a holy grail out there. As you know, many are seeking it. There are a lot of people doing a lot of work on these things around the world. Just look at the various schemes afoot. Much work done and much money spent. 
but we're not there yet, not by long chalk. Some, perhaps uh, ill-advised, schemes have been abject failures. Some scheme promoters are yet to find that their schemes are going to fail likewise. I, for one, would like to see the money spent on something that is likely to succeed and deliver the goods. How might we identify this holy grail when we find it? Here's my suggestion. The best public transport system that 21st century, not 19th, 21st century can devise. And we could put it to the test. We could make a test for this being that it becomes the mode of choice. And I'm talking about free choice. People would actually prefer to travel using this system than using any other mode. And this is without doing what they do in London, congestion tax on some cities, even numbered rego today, odd number tomorrow. Without any of that, free choice, people will rather go to the express commuter system. That will be the test of whether we succeed. That brings me to key point number two, the SP Express Commuter System. It's fully written up in this little book, all in our notes and bolts, all the explanations. Tonight I emphasize the process, the process leading to the thinking that goes behind the detail. The process of taking a blank sheet to start with, not having any blinkers on about, oh yeah, let's think of a way to improve the service uh, that we're getting from our buses. We'll buy a few more buses and put them on the routes. They did that in Brisbane, didn't work. The buses couldn't pull up at the stops in Adelaide Street because other buses were there. So the empty bus shot past, didn't work. The important step, I believe, is to get the specification right. What is it we really want, the Holy Grail? Get that right. And that's what we're going to talk about mainly. The spec system is actually a detailed story about a system that's notional, doesn't exist anywhere, it's in virtual reality up there, that has the nuts and bolts and descriptions of how it all works, what it looks like, how it works. But it's put forward simply as one possible design, just to make it clear that we believe it is possible. It's not like waiting for some great technical breakthrough, like moving from a propeller-driven aircraft motor to a jet engine. It's not a leap forward like that. I believe we have all the technology at our fingertips, not on the hands of one person, of course. It's spread and we have to get teams to put all these skills together to get somewhere. So the PowerPoint presentation tonight is about the detail of this process. So we're all here tonight. To, you're here to help me in the search for this holy grail. It could be an alternative title to the one you just saw. The system for my over moving people around quickly and efficiently. Can we do it better? If so, how? We all know the problem. Key point number one, there's a problem. If anyone here hasn't been caught in a traffic jam ever in their life, please hold up their hand. We all know the problem. What's the solution? Private cars, public transport, an acceptable mix, 
Are our present efforts on track? Should we be really working hard to get more uptake of personal rapid transit systems? There are plenty of them under development and working around the world. And why is this holy grail so elusive? Here are some of the impediments. Great difficulty in prizing people out of their much-loved cars. That situation is certainly a change in that attitude is certainly not helped by big oil. Big oil meaning the four big oil producers in the world, people like um, BP and uh, ExxonMobil and uh, so on, Shell. There are certainly formidable obstacles in retrofitting some new scheme into an existing city, but I'm not daunted by that. There are opportunities from time to time when something new happens. There's a new greenfields development somewhere, or there's a corridor. And really, you need to start somewhere with something. I'll take some questions uh, towards the end. Let me just get through this. Let's take a different approach. Take our blank sheet and look at where we go from there. So this is the most important slide of the night and the one I want you to take home with you and think about when you think, oh, what did Brian talk about? It's our blank sheet, place where we start. We're going to write down some things on this blank sheet. What does the commuter want? Safety, comfort service available when I want it, thanks, not when the provider would like to provide it. A respectable speed, what do I mean by that? Well, I think 100 is not a bad choice. I want to go express from my chosen start to my desired destination. What does the operating authority want? They want a system that actually works. They don't want something that will jam. They would like it to have a high carrying capacity. They want it to be reliable, efficient. They would like happy customers. We'd like to avoid operating empty vehicles we see so often running around when there's no custom. What society want? System for local, and we don't mind if the pollution's out there somewhere. Well, those of us who are looking globally are trying to deal with that as well. But we don't want cities that suffer smog. We'd like to minimise road, ra road rage and trauma. Think of the money you'd save in the country if you didn't have medical trauma from all our road accidents. We want our cities to be pleasant to live in. And there are a number of other tests that we could apply. So are we there yet? No. Still a way to go. Much of what we know is, has its origins in 19th century technology, electric motors, driving vehicles, all that sort of thing. There's plenty of work going on around the world on personal rapid transit, but it's a bit diverse, uncoordinated, and slow to find acceptance. And to my way of thinking, the schemes don't yet join all the dots. We want to devise a really good system. So I put to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the spec system. First started this hobby horse about 1972 when I published a technical paper. And since then, I've lost no opportunity to talk to people 
about these ideas, to try to get people to think laterally. We who have an engineering background are used to working with specifications. You want to go and build a bridge, uh, a builder wants to go and build a house, you have a specification that sets out what is required. That way you've got a chance of actually building what is required. You know what is required. It's not a build as you go type of thing. Not if it's well managed. So we'll get a specification, a wish list. And we will be courageous and bold and we'll put all sorts of things down on it that we think, well, that mightn't be achievable, but hey, what, let's write it down. We don't rule it out because we're starting to think cost, feasibility. No, no, throw that at the others. Go to NASA and say, oh, you guys put a man on the moon. Build me this, please. This is my specification, build me this. This is new, I didn't have this back in the 70s, but virtual design using um, computer-aided design, I think it'd be a beautiful way to educate a, a lot of people about how some of these things might work, how they actually work and how they're different to what we have now. So the book goes from the broad overview as I've shared with you tonight down to specific nuts and bolts and trying to deliver this wish list. And some of the features in the spec system, it's safe. All the vehicles move at a common speed, under automatic control, no drivers. The system speed I have in mind is something like 100, just to give you a feel for it, because I could be talking the system for the city that runs at 30. Many of the personal rapid systems are that sort of speed. Spec system envisages no drivers. Everyone comfortably seated, no strap hanging. Express travel on demand 24-7. Now express doesn't mean the same thing as fast, although we might often use them as synonyms. Express means I go from A to B, my choice, without intermediate stops. I might go there slowly. So speed is one thing, express service is one without intermediate stops. And it goes when you go to your station and you want a vehicle, it's there, you get in it, and it goes 24-7. And I've calculated and I've presented the argument in here that the system will be 30 freeways. And carrying capacity, one lane of the spec system, which is about the width of a lane on a motorway, will carry what 30 motorway lanes will carry. How would it be possible? Well, it depends how long you've got tonight, whether you would like to join me here for breakfast. Mm -hmm. or we can go into all the detail. The book has all the detail. We will talk about some of it. But one aim of the book was to sh at least show that there is a way. So I've been criticised. The book is not full of all the diagrams, nuts and bolts. People have said, but Brian, you haven't shown us, shown us what the vehicle looks like. And I've done it on purpose. I want to talk about what the vehicle actually provides to you as a traveller, and we can go from there to design something. And there are choices. And I wanted a relatively inexpensive book. I didn't want a big tome that uh, was going to be on the bookshelves for $40.
Has a system like this been built anywhere in the world? The answer is no. But there's a lot of work being done with pod car designs around the world. We keep an eye on them. There are various systems that have some of the features, such as seats for all, point to point service. Point to point amongst the people who talk about this stuff doesn't mean your front door to your office. What it means is from your starting station to your destination station. On demand, some of them. Ski lift is on demand, isn't it? Get into a chair when you want. They come around all the time, on demand. Around the clock, energy efficient. They've all got these things. But to my mind, none of them join all the dots. Googled it, which is a while ago now. You get 64 million results. If all you do is put in podcasts, so much is going on. And one of my great disappointments, I tried very, very hard, very hard to get politicians, bureaucrats, at all levels, federal, state, local, to take public transport seriously. I could tell you a little story about that. Maybe I shouldn't, this might go on air. <laughs> the mayor might uh, actually tune in and watch it, but um, we had a bit of a discussion about this at local government level, and I struck people who think putting more buses on is visionary. I think many of you would be familiar with the sort of things that are being developed along the line of podcasts, things that are happening in Heathrow Airport and in America and other cities. Um, how many of you here have heard of a city called Mazda? Mazda, a couple of responses. Mazda. Mr. Now claims to be the most, where is it? It's in the Middle East, United Arab Emirates, not far from Dubai. But not one of these systems is comparable to the spec system in the method of gathering pods together, the method of entering and leaving the driveway, and there isn't one that puts all the things together. Pat and I have travelled in Zurich on a vehicle that had no driver, that had no motor. So there's nothing new in that, and it can be done. And this just happened to be like the lift we came up, or elevators, as our American friends call them, except they did it horizontally. In the old days, you'd ride a lift, there'd be a lift driver there. Usually an elderly gentleman sitting on a little seat, and he would drive the lift. None of you here are old enough to remember back to then, but I do. These days, you don't have a driver. You get in, press a button. Same thing in Zurich. From arriving at the airport to baggage claim, horizontal lift. Glass doors open. Step in, press the button, you go. Carries what? 30? 35? Something like that? Very good. How does it work? Cable drawn. With a winch somewhere where you can't see it. So, let's talk in a nutshell. The need is pressing. Car is not the answer. We can debate that. We can have an argument, if you like, about that. Um, mixed modes, somewhat workable, but needs better integration. Great system needs a great concept. We start with a blank sheet and specify our wants. Key message, in seeking the holy grail, 
we have this system called the spec system to think about. How would we chart a course to develop this sort of thing? Well, I believe we could have academic, business, government somehow working together on R&D, research and development. We could start by standardising the basic metrics so we agree on uh, system speed. We won't be like our Scottish and English friends who come to Australia and build different rail gauges. We'll get a standard and then everyone around the world can pitch in and help, at least we'd all be on the same um, standard speed. The book talks about a time pulse and a slot of time. I'll explain that a little more later. But this is one of the early parameters that would be good to get agreement on if there is to be development of such a concept. The same with the configuration of a, a train or a platoon or a cluster, as I call it in a book, a cluster of vehicles, being a number of vehicles together, close together. Not joined together, but close together. And some sort of um, commonality in working on propulsion system. Now, perhaps Australia's population is not big enough for us to work on this, wait for the Americans to do it. But I think we've had a proud history of invention. And of late I've been thinking that a um, very good way forward because it's inexpensive, I think, is this 3D virtual reality. And I'd be very happy if there's somebody here tonight who's good at that, who'd like to come and introduce themselves to me over a cup of tea, and we can take all this a bit further. Uh, just to finish off, of course, on a little um, light note, some of the people would have us all running around in little beauties like these. And I don't knock it. Um, no doubt such things will have their place. That's the end of the slideshow. And I know you're going to say to me, Brian, you've talked a lot about um, big picture views, generalities, and so on, but we don't really know what the spec system looks like and how it works. So, okay, we'll go up in a satellite and we'll look down on the world and we have one of these great cameras that can zoom. So we start off looking at the globe and then we look at a country and then we look at Victoria and then we focus down on Melbourne and we look at Melbourne's arteries, its traffic arteries, and you see that there are very distinguishable arteries. You've got the Eastern Freeway, you've got the Western Freeway, you've got freeways running north, south, east. Um, like the human body, you've got the arteries, you've got the veins, you've got all the other roads feeding in around the city. But to make it understandable, let's go to Flemington and look at the racetrack. And so the spec system, we have a, an oval track. And it might be of such dimension that it's got 10 stations on it. And we think about our computer when we're updating the antivirus. We have a bar with a little light going along it. We've all seen that. And so we use that technique to show these pulses that SPEC runs on. SPEC runs on time pulses of four seconds. Four seconds is a slot of time in which you can put eight vehicles safely onto this continually moving circuit of 100 kilometers an hour. Every four seconds you can put eight vehicles in there. Each vehicle carries six people. Now to make it clear, let's take some colors. Let's make blue light traveling along represents four seconds into which we can load these people. It's a bit like traveling on the motorway and you've got the slip roads coming in the side. The difference is 
we have a motorway that's given you a guaranteed slot. So if you're in eight vehicles that's lined up, getting your speed up to match the 100 of the motorway, we don't have any guarantee that there's room for us. So we mix it with the semi-trailers and the big cars, the little cars, whatever, and we keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. So we design a system where you have the slots, and this slot is allocated to that inroad from Caloundra, joining the Bruce Highway travelling south. But some other slot is allocated to some other entrance. So go back to our Flemington race course, and we've got blue light. That represents input from station number one. So we've got two stations now on the system. We introduce a red light right on the tail of the blue. So red's travelling, blue's travelling. All the red light is four second gap for station number two. And as many stations as we have around the circuit, we have that many colours. And then you can imagine this thing, it just goes round and round this set of colours, blue, red, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it repeats and it goes all day. 24 hours a day, around the clock, forever. Every station number one gets an opportunity. How often? Gets an opportunity to send people away every time its colour comes up. Every time its colour comes up, it's blue. Nobody else is going to be on it. Blue's going to arrive empty. We can load up blue. It's the number of stations times four. So if we've got 10 stations on the route, every 40 seconds, we can load people on. If there's 20 stations on the route, every 80 seconds, we can load our collection of vehicles on. And so instead of a collection of people at the station waiting for a train and arrive and a thousand or one on at once, you're continually sending these people away and clearing Central Station and if you've got to wait 80 seconds to go, I think you're not going to comply. So it's a good concept. Right? That's concept number one. We have a fast moving system with a guarantee of Now, we're getting on safely. Even more. Because this four second slot to 28 metres a second, a 20 space in which the first one second has vehicles, the next three seconds is unoccupied. Close together, safety gap. One of the eight vehicles can get off without disturbing the others. So we've got to make our computer wizardry look a bit different. We can keep the blue and red and all the other colours, but we now need to have some computer simulation of an eight vehicle cluster. That's the term I've used in the book, a cluster. Nose to tail, which go up together. Well, we need to somehow identify individual vehicle. I'm sure you can do it. You can think of a way of doing it so that we can then sit back and look at how a vehicle can go off and exit and leave the other seven. Off. Or, or the first and fifth, okay? That's the trick that enables you to provide express travel because when we leave in a cluster, the people in those vehicles aren't all going to the same place. Okay, the, ve the people within the vehicle are going to the same place. So it's like sharing a cab at the airport. You come out and say, oh, who's going to um, Frankston or who's going to uh, Kew? And we get a few people together to fill a cab and they go. So the spec system has a vehicle that loads up with six people to a common exit point. All, right. All that clear? 
Now we can provide for that nurse who works at night. She's young. She works at night. She gets off night shift late. She goes down to a dark car park somewhere and she gets molested on the way. We can provide a spec system where the routes deliver into the hospital. So she goes to the point in the hospital at which you get into vehicles and if she wants she can get into a vehicle on her own. She doesn't want to travel with somebody she doesn't like the look of. Much safer. Now I think it's question time. I'll get Michael to moderate question time but I, I did want to try and give you at least a little feeling for the difference in the way the system works compared to anything we now have. Thank you, Brian. Well, I, th I think you'll agree that that was a, uh, a different type of a talk. It, uh, it doesn't uh, have the nuts and bolts, as you've been saying, that engineers love to have. Um, it's really, it really is a concept thing. Um, and like Brian was saying, I think if you go on the web, you'll find plenty of um, uh, opportunities to see uh, these types of um, vehicles actually in place, but none of them have really quite achieved the end point. So really, let's just open up the conversation. Discussion. Would your system have Mikey on it? <laughs> <laughs> Would your system have Mikey? That's our ticket system here in uh, Melbourne that we were talking no, about. No, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> am I allowed to say this on television, on uh, the World Wide Web? Yes, of course. Um, That's the I'm not sure if I'm going here talking about these things. Yeah. 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 We can say it for you. Um, sucks. <laughs> I used to love coming to Melbourne because I could get around so easily on the trams and I liked the way they ran then. Now I arrived and I haven't been on one yet because I only got here late yesterday. And I'm told that, Brian, you can't do Perhaps in some ways, maybe what you used to do. You know, these life for the visitor of the city, more complex. Mm -hmm. So um, the answer to your question is I would um, take that question on notice and work on it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Brian. What would you do um, with personal transport for people wanting to transport one place to another? They want to be able to go to the location that they want to go to. I guess the transport is from near your home to near the destination where you want to go. How does your system address that? I'll get Michael to repeat the questions for the um, viewing yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you want to travel from point A to point B, which is fairly close to where you currently are, to where you currently uh, eventually you want to end up. How, how, do you, how do you actually organise it so that you can actually do that in a single camp or a pod? Well, I see, I see the system as being conceptually a, a little bit like our um, electrified rail system in that it's got fixed stations. I don't see that you can get away from that. And I wrote a book about the actual installation from the front door to the infrastructure, but I think differently to the way we do it now, and that might be another book if I live long enough. Uh, I had open heart surgery when I was supposed to be here talking to you. I'm glad I'm erect and still holding in there. Actually, they did a good job on me, so um, I feel pretty good. But the spec system will be, in my view, designed so that it improves the way you travel from your origin station to your destination station in a concept like our electrified, like the London Underground. You got it from the station to your office or to the shopping you want to do or any of that, then we enter a new challenge, I think, for the way we do that. But if the, and that's why I talk about an overall view of the city and all the arteries, because if we do that well, if, we, if you go to France, get an atlas. Look at France, but strip away all the unnecessary and just look at the villages around France and the way they're interconnected. Agglomeration. And I think that's a good model for a city like Melbourne or any other. They're a great mass. 
I'd like to make a word about that later. Um, but that would, to my mind, be a, a better way. Think of not um, all these centres in which a lot of activities go on, and it's very good interconnectors, and usually more than one way. If something happens in trance, you can't go this road from here to here, you can go there. It's like a lot of little triangles joined together. And to me, it looks like a good model. Much better than the idea of having um, everything come into the CBD. And so many cities have grown that way. Yes, Melbourne. If you look at um, Melbourne, you've got these arteries. And it tends to be, and I talk in the book, about various configurations of root layer. They can be like a spider's web. You have the radials, like your arterial freeways, and then some ring roads, as they have in Canberra. Or they can be grid. And as you know, a spreadsheet, you can go from cell here to cell there by going column row, the same spatially, you could go a certain distance on a straight route and a certain distance in the other x, y direction to get from A to B, or you can go radially and then a bit of circle. So you get within, maybe not spitting distance, but maybe walking distance or cycling distance, and so maybe we have a better plan for public hide cycles than we have introduced into Brisbane, they don't get used enough. Um, and the whole thing needs to be integrated. I'm not sure if that satisfies you. Is that I think it does, because when I look at the Melbourne transport system, it's biased around going into the city, and all the rail links going to the city. Yeah. Whereas most people... It always makes it difficult, want doesn't it? To, uh, access public transport actually want to go somewhere else. You know, where there's no ring, there's no ring roads or really much else. I think we could still do that sort of thing with spec if it was necessary, get people all in <coughs> the centre. But the centre would, would probably have a ring route not too far out so that everything doesn't land at Central Station, but an outer route might come in and then do the circuit and have a, a number of drop-off points rather than one. It seems to me to be better to decentralise that activity somewhere. But could I just have a word about megacities? If you um, don't go away. No. Um, just quickly, it's been predicted by 2025. Now let me start here. I came to Melbourne, it's lovely, the weather's nice and we enjoy it. I've got a few friends in Sydney, so they come down to, to join me and they like it, so they ask their friends and they come down. And be Before you know it, you've got the whole of Sydney here, right? We've gone from four and a quarter million to maybe nine. Okay? So we better suck in Brisbane and all the other capitals. And we're getting nearly the whole of Australia and we're getting up to the 20 million that they're predicting the size of megacities. 2025, we're going to have nine of them. Biggest, Tokyo, closely followed by a couple of India, some in South America where I've been um, recently. What's it going to be like living in an agglomeration that's of size 20 million? It won't want to be like we arrange things now. So it's pretty scary stuff. Mm. Mm. I'm not saying Melbourne is going to be one of those 20 million <coughs> candidates. You can look at the UN webpage with these statistics and they break it down by cities and make these projections, but it's pretty scary stuff. Fine. Any other questions? Yes, Rebecca. What would be the energy source used to propel vehicles? Do you the question? What would the energy source be used to propel these vehicles? I was rather hoping you would tell me that, <laughs> because it's part of what I am here to do tonight is to encourage the ATA to maintain the interest and development it is with the way we use electricity to propel vehicles. In the book I discuss all sorts of ways of making a vehicle move. 
but the one I select as my choice and I think is best is electricity. So it's remote. Um, I'm not talking about onboard batteries, I'm talking about an inert vehicle that has no motor. So how do you use electricity to make it go? British Rail drive their trains with the linear induction motor. That's the way they make them travel. The way it works is you've got windings in the track. No, you've got a, a like a keel, like a strip of metal between the two rails. And either side of the... Uh, ...was developed in the train move. Uh, it's windings which, when you power them, electric motor works. But instead of making it rotary, you make it linear. I would like to turn that upside down. I don't know if it's been done, but one of the challenges here tonight to Swinburne is to do it. Try making a vehicle that has the windings in the track and the vehicle, the reactive plate. First thing you're going to say to me is, Brian, that'll be terribly expensive, but I'm not so sure we shouldn't at least make some prototypes. Does that answer your question, Rebecca? It's a motor that hasn't been invented yet. But I think it will work. Because it works the other way around. And reaction is reaction. You want, you know, you blow something, does it move or do you <laughs> do move? Yeah, I'm quite fascinated by the object panel as well. I'm a bit of a blog, also I've turned up for me, so I'm quite surprised about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't close my eyes, I felt. Um, I'm fascinated by the concept, but I'm probably a bit grounded on down to earth. And, um, I've had some ideas also. Uh, and there are, to me, there, a lot can be done by some fairly simple things in traditional modes. For example, um, uh, the other day it took me six hours to go door to door from Camberwell to Sydney by plane. That took me an hour, that was the 9.30 flight, that took me an hour and a quarter in the traffic, which is what you say there. The, it's another half an hour or so checking in, plane leaves an hour late, get there, then I've got a train the other end, it's convenient that I've got one in the airport, get to where I go. It took me six hours. Coming home it took me four. You can do a high-speed train between Sydney and Melbourne just to solve one issue there. And then, by the way, the road traffic getting into the airport that time in the morning, as people have done it, it's even earlier, it's just horrendous. High-speed train could do that in four hours. And if we're talking cost, then you sort of compare all sort of figure. Uh, I've done high-speed trains throughout in um, Germany and uh, China. And it's done, you know, in city centre to city centre. We should be grasping those opportunities. But there's little things we can do. They, for example, uh, the other main train, the train line, which happens to be my one, one, terminates at a spot. It could be linked through to whole Combsley. It could be linked through to Chester, linked through to the other line. A lot of train lines in Melbourne could be put underground. The land value would justify it. And it could be sold off in, in Hong Kong. They'll extend the line, build a centre around that railway station, and it becomes a little uh, metropolis of its own. Uh, getting back to your matrix linking. We don't seem to look at these things. I, I think tonight was something on the news about some grand plan for railway networks, but it didn't show linkages. They're simple linkages. You know, a Waddle Street tram could run down, uh, which features there, could run down Elba Road, three quarters of it down the parkland, and connect to the uh, Burwood Road where the Deacon Canvas is. That would, a student that currently lives, say, in Box Hill, South, or around Waddle Park, has to go all the way to Richmond, like tram or train, to then get a, a tram out to the university where it's only, you know, literally two kilometres. Yeah. So little linkages like that could create a lot of matrices mattress, in Melbourne. And um, to me, that's something which we should be addressed. High-speed train, very simple route. The legislation was passed in Victoria back in the 1980s to do it. Um, you just go high-speed train, sit, uh, from the um, Spencer Street to the airport, as I have in Frankfurt, and have a high, high speed train that goes through stops at the airport, as well as other trains. You would then stop in um, Albury Wodonga, you would stop in Canberra, you would stop in either Campbelltown or Parramatta, 
and you next thing you see the exit tunnel. It has to be twin tunnels because of the pressure of the thing, you can't have them on one tunnel. But these things are possible, and, and when I would think that on my so called hour, one hour flight to Sydney or one hour flight to Melbourne, it took me actually 10 hours of travel time to get there and back for, for what was effectively a three hour meeting. You really start to wonder. Mm. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think any of us would disagree with you though. Uh, the, 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 I mean, you, you got the thrust of that. The major comment was that we've got infrastructure at the moment which isn't probably properly integrated, yeah. and um, and your Alla Main line, of course, used to be a, an outer circle railway line mm. that um, you know that they decided didn't, wasn't used <laughs> um, and could well be put back. But yeah, um, so yeah, well, I, I agree with everything you've said. Um, and I long had a belief that uh, good train design, good high speed train designs, and I've been on some as well, and uh, places like Switzerland, they do trains very well, um, to the point that people say we don't bother having a car, thanks, we can get around quite nicely on our rail system. Um, I think the high speed rail is a very good competitor. Um, on domestic air travel, I'd like to discuss detail of particular transport options in particular bits of cities. But I do think that uh, I do want to make it clear that the spec concept is for the inner urban. It's never been my thought that it would be for travel from Melbourne to Sydney, but only the analogy of travel in a suburban electrified rail network or a, a tram network, just the urban area. And then you either let your planes and your high speed rail look after the other. That's a nice match. And, and things have got to be integrated, haven't it they? It could be done on an, on an elevated basis. Yes. Like in Quail, we've got three different monorail systems. Very efficient. Uh, unfortunately, not if there's some great newfangled yeah, wonderful not. thing, but all it means is you've got a track and you put it up instead of having it on the ground or underground. And in, in uh, discussing the spec system, we talked about a totally open a choice of route, whether it's above, on ground, or under. Um, but it is a requirement that be grade separated. And I know some people weren't sure what that meant, but you can't have intersections where vehicles could potentially collide. So if from an aeroplane it looks if they're at the crossing, it's got to be at different levels. Grade separation. All these routes are continuous, one way. One way. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to know um, about urban density and, and uh, what sort of urban density would you need in order for uh, uh, this sort of uh, system to uh, to be uh, workable? What would like to see happen is some... I'm not at all sure um, on... Uh, further design work using skills that I haven't got, like um, 3D virtual design, to get some of the detail worked out, and then maybe build a prototype track. I have a belief that if you start these things, you think back to when they first had rail. They, they built it for a reason, it was very short, stopped into Darlington. Do you think those people thought they'd be building rail bridges across Victoria River and Victoria Falls and had no idea where rails would go around the world. It's a, if it's good, it works, it takes off. And maybe there's no reason why it can't be in Little City. But you'd have to start somewhere. And um, when I made objections to putting it into an existing urban area, I think in Brisbane when they built the um, elevated track out to the airport, that they're on the aerotrain, they call it, uh, that could just as easily be a prototype spec. A great opportunity. It had a specific function. It had the real estate. 
and it would work. I've been in the aeroplane. I go up on a flight that's delayed, and I get in there at 1 a.m. There's no aeroplane. Uh, the last train went at whatever 10 o'clock or something. I apologise to the management of aeroplane that you're <laughs> currently running a little later, but it's not a 24/7 service. Mm. Uh, can we just ask any, one more question? If there's another question, because all right, okay, thank, you. thank you. All right, thank you, Brian. I think. Uh, no, else does it come in any other colours? <laughs> I, I think this is a topic that is, um, as I say, it's quite challenging and um, it's something that I think that a lot of urban designers don't really get their head around. They go for the safe option, we've already got roads, let's build small roads, or we've already got rail, let's build a bit more rail. Um, and don't look at what um, the potentials are out there. And I think it's people like Brian who keep going around waving the flag for 30, 40 years now. Um, <laughs> And, uh, right, and, and hopefully, hopefully somewhere along the line, somebody will take it up. And I think um, what Brian's saying about uh, possibly just having a test bed somewhere. I, I mean, I live in near Box Hill. And I've always loved the thought that, that the original tram line was in Box Hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, I actually uh, uh, sent an email off to the local council saying, wouldn't it be a wonderful um, uh, tourist attraction if we had something <coughs> like this going from Box Hill to Doncaster Shopping Town? Where the original tram used to go. Um, that was too hard for them to get their head around. Get some of the uh, <laughs> Swinburne students to do a project. Yeah, well, I think that's what it's it all yeah. But anyway, look, I think uh, I think we'll call it quits there and just say uh, thank you very much, Brian, for a very stimulating uh, uh, talk and uh, some lovely uh, sort of ideas. And I, I hope that uh, these have lodged in people's brains and uh, you know things will swirl around and maybe something will come out of it all. And uh, so thank you very much for coming down. All right, thank you for the invitation. Yes.